Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. And Vicky Panos, I'm not completely clear on the indications for extraction based on the x-rays. Is it the pulp cavity that seems compromised apically? And Vico, we, uh, we're... we're um, also doing this as a podcast so let me describe what you're talking to and show the people in the workshop exactly what we're talking about as far as the x-ray goes so this is this is what Vico's talking about we've got a fourth premolar the distal root has maybe a two millimeter decrease in bone density around the apex of that distal root and the arrow is pointing to that so if you're listening you can appreciate what that lucency looks like and so if that lucency is there back to the question if, if, if the pulp cavity is compromised apically is extraction indicated and the answer to that is it may be uh, and usually is but the other alternative is root canal so you never know, it may be that the client wants to pursue saving that tooth. And if that lucency is just not horrendous, and it's not associated with a suborbital fistula, then with treatment, removing the disease pulp, sterilizing the canal, which is essentially the first phases of a root canal therapy or root canal treatment, and then placing a sterile material in the canal and then sealing that eliminates the thorn in the abscess, right? When you think about thorns in abscesses or foreign bodies in abscesses, if you remove the thorn, the abscess is exposed and drains and then it resolves with or without antibiotics in most cases. So the same thing here you remove the source of the infection and the tooth stays where it's sterile, the sterile material is not compromised, the tooth uh, or the uh, bone around the tooth root starts to resolve or remains the same and never progresses and there's no dissolution of the apex of the root over time which we follow radiographically then that's a perfectly good alternative. If the client does not want to do that, if you have a periapical lucency, there is no instance where you would leave that. You always want to extract a tooth if the owner does not opt for root canal, if there is a periapical lucency around the tooth root. So nice, nice question there. So let's transition to our uh, next next question here before we close this case uh, and this is a good question that everybody needs to know the answer to because we do this a lot so Kimberly ask about diamond football or diamond burrs and if we only have one what do we need and the diamond football burr would be the one to go that's mainly the larger one that's a canine football burr Cindy asked a similar question uh, wondering what size of football burrs that you should have and how you decide on cross-cut burrs and in, in all these cases 
and with the equipment, instruments, courses, whatever, you can also go to drbetspets.com, and that's got everything you need. It's not a hard website to navigate like all the other dental websites that you have to search through hundreds of, of burrs. We've got everything on one page that we recommend that we, we use in our practice and that we recommend our students use. We've got some burrs that we use in our practice that we don't, use, we don't recommend for general practice just because you don't use them that much. But the ones we do have are on here. So um, the feline cross, or the feline diamond football burr, excuse me, is a little smaller than the canine diamond football burr and it's great for small cats in small places in the back part of the mouth around the first molar uh, and other otherwise canine diamond football burr uh, is medium grit versus the fine grit on a cat feline burr so you can use that on larger cats or larger areas in cats and dogs and then we also have that tapered diamond that's a fine diamond that we can use down into alveoli or places that are deeper that are hard to reach so we recommend all of those for the football burrs, for those of you who are doing a dentistry at a volume that is significant uh, where you're doing multiple cases a week. And then as far as your crosscut burrs, the 701L, which is for canine vestibular bone removal, grooves, and larger uh, dogs, uh, and pretty much everything from a bone removal standpoint in dogs and large cats, and then for some small dogs and for cats, for making your grooves mesial and distal, that 669 thinner cross-cut taper burr is the way to go with that. And Kimberly asks, can you please explain vital pulp therapy? And we use vital pulp therapy mainly in cases where there have been super recent fractures that the owner knows that the fracture was at a certain point in time which almost never is accurate unless they actually see the fracture as it occurs look at the pulp cavity and see it's bleeding that's the only time that we would consider historically doing something for uh, uh, saving that tooth without having to go to a root canal extraction and I think that's a later question that we have. But vital pulp therapy, essentially what it does, it allows us to either reduce the crown when we've got a malocclusion, for instance, a mandibular canine tooth that's impinging upon the, the palate and digging into the palate, causing a malocclusion, uh, or we have a, a fresh fracture that's less than 24 hours old, uh, ideally, and uncontaminated or at the most 48 hours old after that the statistical success rate are very poor so we would essentially do root canals on those if the owner wants to save them or if in practice if they don't uh, that's an extraction you want to extract that tooth if you're comfortable extracting teeth that have no perio <clears throat> and that's with a surgical flap mucoperiosteal flap and exposure and extraction with using burrs to remove vestibular bone, making grooves, extracting the tooth, contouring the bone with a diamond football burr, and then suturing that close after a radiograph confirms that that tooth has indeed been fully extracted. Back to vital pulp therapy, if that's the indication, based on what I just said, where we're trying to save a tooth and not compromise the pulp then what we would do would be to get down to healthy pulp in the case of a fracture or we would do a crown amputation in the case of a malocclusion with a sterile burr under under reasonably sterile circumstances and we'd remove a couple millimeters of the pulp depending on how big that patient is maybe maybe a, a less than that and then that's going to bleed so we have to control the hemorrhage and then we place mineral trioxide aggregate which is a biological cement literally a cement uh, that you could go into 
Home Depot and buy a big sack of that uh, is the same thing. It's just it's just sterile and they've they've put it through the sterilizing process but it's essentially a cement or they have liquefied it to make it easily applicable and that's what we use and then that sits on the pulp and lets that pulp heal and then that is cured if it's if it's a if it's a liquid like we use or if it's just the actual cement itself or the MTA itself it's placed on the pulp and then on top of that, we use what's called a glass ionomer generally, or a composite, or both, that seals the restoration, seals the tooth in multiple layers. So that allows that tooth to stay viable, and then we recheck that radiographically every six months or so for a couple times. And if, it, if in a year it's still, uh, the tooth is growing, the dentin's getting smaller with the growth of that tooth, and everything is fine radiographically, then we're, uh, we, we've got a successful procedure. Success rate on those, <clears throat> if they're done with a vital uh, pulp with a malocclusion under pretty sterile circumstances are greater than 90%. And if it's within 24 hours, probably close to 90%. So that hope that answers your question. And uh, good question. So good way to, to start off this, uh, uh, this group of questions. So Carol Kaluka. Is there a time limit where a root canal would not be an option? For instance, a fracture that is a year or older. Great question, Carol. And the answer to that, if there is a fracture that is five years old and the changes are not super significant on x-ray where you've got a huge periop apical lucency but there's pulp exposure, those can still be saved uh, with a root canal. If the owner doesn't want to opt for root canal and referral, which is usually the case, you guys are going to find out if you're offering referral for a lot of these things we're talking about today that most clients are not going to do it. Maybe there's not a referral practice close. Maybe they don't have the funds to do that. Maybe saving that tooth is not the best uh, in, in, their, in their interest justifiably. Maybe it's not a tooth that we'd save. You know, we save canine teeth maxillary fourth premolars and mandibular first molars occasionally uh, but for the most part that's the ones that we do root canals on incisors sometimes if it's a working dog maybe a uh, a dog that's a special needs dog or maybe it's a uh, police dog sheriff's dogs we do nasa down here in orlando uh, we do their uh, bomb sniffing dogs on uh, cape canaveral uh, in uh, uh, cocoa beach but uh, that, that aside, there are times when that, uh, that wouldn't, wouldn't even play a role. If you're talking about a premolar or the last molar, those are not really functional teeth. So we, we wouldn't even consider root canals on those. Those are always extractions. Uh, we're not going to do a, a root canal on a premolar tooth that's not a fourth upper premolar. It uh, just doesn't make sense. Those teeth are not uh, functional. They don't occlude, they don't chew teeth or t <laughs> chew, chew food. They might chew teeth if there's a malocclusion, <laughs> but they don't chew food. Uh, that's, that's done in the back part of the mouth for the most part. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't consider those. So Carol, hope, hope that answers your question. Uh, very good question there uh, from, that, from that respect. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.